Turn in your Bibles, please, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. We're going to look at through the end of chapter 15 today and into the first few verses of chapter 16 as we think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mark 15, 42 through chapter 16, verse 8. Stand with me if you would. I hope you've found that in your Bible. And if you don't have a Bible with you, we've got the text on the screen, but we really want you to have your own copy of Scripture. If you'll see me, we'll see what we can do to get you a copy of having your own hand in your own possession. Follow along as I read this text, please. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Chapter 16. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is what it is, the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And we have read this morning the most amazing event in the history of the world. The resurrection of our Savior from the dead. That's why we can sing with hope today. We don't sing about a dead Savior. We sing about a risen Savior. Born to die and come back to life. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ is the most important fact of history. Without a, without a death, there would be no meaningful discussion of resurrection. But without a resurrection, there would not be really meaning to his death. And so it's interesting, when you read the gospel accounts, the great pains that the Holy Spirit went to to be sure that we know And anyone who is willing to investigate knows that there are witnesses to this. Concerning his his death that we read about last week, there was the Roman centurion. So a, a Roman, a Gentile witness who had no stake in this really, had nothing to gain, confirmed Jesus' death. The women who stood there, we talked about them last Sunday who were there as eyewitnesses, when, when, his, when all of his disciples except one had, had fled the scene, these women who were eyewitnesses, and the disciple, John, who was standing there with the mother of Jesus as Jesus died. But there's also a great testimony to his resurrection. These women who go to the tomb, we'll talk about them in a few minutes. We know if we put the, weave the gospel accounts together that that Peter uh, and the disciple Jesus loved (laughs) ran to the tomb to investigate for themselves when they were told. And then the post-resurrection appearances that Jesus makes as recorded in the gospel accounts. And Paul attests to this. He he bears witness in 1 Corinthians at the end of 1 Corinthians in chapter 15 when he says that, that he was seen by the twelve, that is by the disciples. He was seen by 500 brethren who were 
gathered on the Mount of Ascension just prior to his entering back to heaven. And Paul says, and then by me is one born out of, out of season. There's ample witness to the death, the real death, and the real physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And all of Christianity hinges on that. It hangs on that. If it was, if it was speculative, if it was doubtful, then you could not explain what you read in the book of Acts. The life-changing reality that gripped those, those timid disciples so that they would boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ had risen from the grave. You cannot explain the change in their lives. You cannot explain the power of their witness and the fact that Christianity has advanced now for 2,000 years. And so I want us to see for just a few minutes today in these verses before us, the burial of Jesus in verses 42 to 47, and the resurrection of Jesus in chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Now, this burial of Jesus, look over it again with me. Just We're told some things in this, that when the evening had come, because it was the day of preparation. Well, what is this day of preparation? It is, it is, the, it is the day before the Sabbath. And if you remember Jewish timetables, Jewish clocks, uh, their, their way of their thinking that the Sabbath began at 6 p.m. Uh, on the evening before. So if we were in this time frame, on Friday evening at 6 o'clock, the Sabbath would begin. And they had to have all of their uh, preparations made, all the food purchased, everything ready to, to serve the meal. Uh, and this is a high Sabbath time because it's on the heels of Passover, the, one of the highest holy days in Israel. And so we're told that, that Jesus has died. There's about a three-hour window between the time that he dies and the time that Sabbath begins. And we're told about this Joseph of Arimathea. Who is this fellow? We know very little about him, really, historically, except we do know he was on the council. We do know from the gospel accounts that, that when they were, when they were uh, conniving and plotting and planning to, to execute Jesus, arrest him and have him executed, that Joseph did not agree with them. You almost read over that in the gospels. But there's more there. Joseph is apparently one of those secret followers of Jesus. Uh, Nicodemus being another. He's a respected member of the council, we're told. We're told he was a man looking for the kingdom of God. Now, it's interesting. You would think, well, weren't all of the Jewish council, weren't all the Sanhedrin looking for the kingdom of God? Well, certainly they were. They, they, they lived daily discussing the, the coming of Messiah, when, the, when peace would reign, when the people of God would be released from, from tyranny, and this great blessed age would be ushered in. But, but this man was looking uh, with an openness to consider how God might do this. Most of the council was looking through lenses that they already had preconceived. Here's a man whose heart is open to what God is doing. He was looking for the kingdom of God. And then we're told in this text that he took courage and went to Pilate asking for the body of Jesus. I want you to think through this with me, folks. This is probably Joseph's first public act of faith. If you were crucified by the Roman government, you were considered a heinous criminal. You had surrendered lots of rights. One of those rights was the right to be buried. The crucified victim would hang on the cross two to three days. Wild animals, the birds would come and begin to pick the flesh as the, as the victim hung there. Finally, the decay would be so bad that the Romans would take the victims down and throw them into an ash heap. I don't know if you've seen the movie Risen or not. It's a fairly recent movie that's come out. It's a, it's a, it's a, a novel approach of how did the Roman government respond to the resurrection. It's fascinating to watch. It's, it's speculative. We don't know that any of this happened, but it's, but it's good conjecture. But in that, in that movie, they take the crucified victims and throw them uh, not too far into a garbage heap of human decaying flesh. And that would have happened to the victims of crucifixion. Because you see, the family would not dare to try to claim the body. And they would not be allowed to bury the body. And so here's Joseph of Arimathea. When the scripture says he took courage, this was an, an incredibly courageous act. To be identified with one 
who had been crucified because he said he was the king of the Jews. So in the minds of the Jews, he was, he was an insurrectionist. And you remember in the, in the accounts, if you read all the gospel accounts, when, when Pilate asked, shall I crucify your king? They said, we don't have any king but Caesar. You have a responsibility to Caesar. This man is assaulting the throne of Caesar. That's what they were saying. He's an insurrectionist. In the mind. That was the case they made against him. To come and say, I want the body. I want to bury the body of this one who's just been crucified because he dared declare himself a king. He's a usurper. That's fascinating. That's, that's courage. Think about that. And put ourselves there. And then put ourselves here. What do we do today? What do we do today that takes courage to be identified with Jesus? We read this morning about our brothers and sisters in Christ in Colombia. Takes courage there. The Christians in Colombia are hated by the cartels because you see, every person who's brought to faith in Christ is one less customer that the cartels have. One less worker for the cartels. They're a threat to that business. They're a threat to Catholicism in Colombia. And they're hated and it takes courage to be identified. And Joseph of Arimathea displays an incredible amount of courage here when he, when he comes and says, may I have the body of Jesus. We ought to admire that. We ought to say, dear God, please, give me such courage. Give me such courage. Help me to step out of my comfort zone to be identified with Jesus Christ. Well, we're told in verse 44 that Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus had already died. It, again, it took two to three days for the typical uh, victim of crucifixion to die. Jesus died in the span of a few hours. It was the will of God for him not to be there long. He was there long enough to satisfy the divine wrath of God by suffering and dying in our place. So he summons the centurion, one of the experts in death, the man, probably the man who stood there and said, surely this man was a son of God. And he asked him, is it true? And he said, yes. And then the most amazing thing happens. You, folks, when you read this, if you know the historical background of this and you read this, you, you see the hand of God all over this. Pilate consented to give the body of a victim of crucifixion to Joseph of Arimathea to be buried. It's astounding that Joseph would ask. It's unbelievable that Pilate would grant it. When, Je when Jesus told Pilate, Pilate said, don't you realize I, have, I hold your life in my hands? Jesus said, you don't have any power except what's been given to you. And you see that worked out here in the very preparation. So he gives Joseph the body of Jesus. Now Joseph, this was not a, a whim on his part. This is not something he just impetuously, spontaneously did. He had to take advantage of the time, that, that brief window of three hours between the death of Jesus and the Sabbath to go and buy linen, get a linen shroud, to make arrangements, and to be buried in the family tomb. If you and I had walked into this tomb, we probably would have seen something like this. Of an entryway very ornately decorated and painted, and then you go back into the recesses of it, and there would be these, these benches or shelves where the family members would be laid one by one as they themselves gave up life. And you go into that, and Pilate had made those arrangements. There would be a big, a massive stone uh, in the shape of a... Like, this is my lack of capacity to describe it to you, in the shape of a checker, <laughs> if that communicates. A big checker with a groove etched out across the entry to the tomb. And the stone would sit back open until someone was placed in it. So in all likelihood, Jesus is the first person laid in this tomb. I love what S.M. Lockridge, we've played some of his video before on, on the, how Jesus is my king. I wish I could describe him. 
What S.M. Lockridge said years ago when I heard him preach, he said he did not need a tomb of his own because he wasn't going to use it very long. So a borrowed tomb would do just fine. And so the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea's family is used, and they would carry Jesus in there. And after, after that, you know from the other gospel accounts that, that the, the uh, religious leaders were troubled, uh, that Pilate had granted this, and, and they went to him and said, when he was alive, this usurper said that, that he would rise. I, we, you need to seal the tomb and put a Roman guard there. He said, well, we'll do that. So Jesus is being buried. And the stone was rolled across the entrance. And it was sealed. And the women were nearby. The faithful women. Who loved Jesus more than they feared men. It is again a striking contrast to me. That those who had been taught intensely by him for three to three and a half years fled. But the women who had been touched by him drew near. Great concern. And so we see and we celebrate these disciples. Not afraid to be known as disciples. And we see in this passage the high regard that God places on the grave. The grave, a place where we lay those to rest whose life has come to an end on this earth. But also a powerful picture of Christianity. Paul would teach in Romans you were buried with Christ in baptism. You see, Christianity is all about a death and a burial and a resurrection. Chiefly about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but also about those who would follow Him that we must come in a repenting faith and say we too have died to who we were. And we've been buried with Christ. That picture there in baptism symbolizes that our sins have been forgiven. And we've been raised to walk in a new and holy life. Death, burial, resurrection. And the grave is the greatest picture of that. You go into it because you're dead. You come out of it because you're alive. And Jesus sanctifies the grave, if you please. In fact, we know that in the resurrection, He defeats every enemy we have. Sin. Sin no longer reigns over those who are in Christ. Death. Death is something not to be feared by those who are in Christ. The grave. Those who place loved ones in the grave know so that if we, if we place into the grave someone who has lived for Christ while he or she has lived and died in Christ when he or she died, that we have not said goodbye to them but so long for now. We know it's not the end of their lives. It's the end of life as we've known it on this planet, but it's, not, it's, it's the beginning of the most full expression of life everlasting, of eternal life. Jesus sanctifies the grave. Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 15, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because He conquered the grave. So let's look briefly at the resurrection in verses 1 to 8. We're told that, that when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Now, again, if you're tracking Jewish time, the Sabbath passes. It comes to an end. On, if it begins on Friday at 6, it ends on Saturday at 6. And so after the 6 o'clock hour on Saturday, these women go and purchase spices so great is their love and devotion for Him 
They want to be sure he has a proper burial. They want to anoint him. And then interesting, when he was born, the Magi traveling that great distance brought him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Myrrh, a, a very valuable, expensive spice used to anoint. And these women went to get spices. One had anointed him while, while he was still alive. Washed his feet with her hair. Such devotion to Jesus. To be shamelessly identified with him. And so in the evening, these women go to purchase the spices. And then very early, verse 2, on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. It was incredible courage on their part again. Go to the place where the seditionist Jesus had been buried. Being willing to be identified with him as they had been when he was crucified. As they followed Joseph of Arimathea to the tomb when Jesus was placed in the tomb. And now they go to anoint him. But I want you to see something else here. Faith will move you when reason would stop you. Brothers and sisters, had they stopped and thought. I'm not saying that faith is thoughtless. I'm saying that faith will move you beyond what reason will bear. There's a great stone in front of this tomb. And so caught up are they in their devotion to Jesus, to their, to their rabbi, their savior, who has been brutally executed and buried, that it's only as they're going to the tomb that the conversation comes up, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? I'm going to tell you, if you're observing this at a distance, you think these women aren't thinking right. Faith will carry you where reason will not let you go. And it is their, it is their faith-driven desire to honor Him by anointing Him that lets them see at, by levels and degrees the mighty hand of God. Because see, when they get there, the text says, looking up. So we know that they were asking this just as basically as they were rounding the corner to head into the area of the tomb. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. <laughs> and then Mark tells us it was very large, so it wasn't something easy to do. It would have taken several men to push it. And remember all the circumstances surrounding it. They would have had to do so in violation of the Roman seal. They would have had to do so upon pain of death. Those guarding the tomb were assigned the responsibility to keep it intact upon pain of their death. If someone should be successful in breaking the seal and moving the stone and removing the body as... Uh, as was the suspicion of the Sanhedrin, that his disciples would come and steal the body so they could fake, spread fake news of a resurrection. And there they stand, before an empty tomb. And they enter it. And there's just so many things going on here. The stones rolled away, miraculously, unexpectedly. They enter the tomb and they see a young man. And we we we're told from the other gospel accounts that there were two. Uh, one identifies them as angels. An angelic figure is sitting there. Now in this season of the year, at the Christmas season, we're very aware of the announcing angels. We sang, Hark the Herald Angels. There's a, there's a category of herald 
angels. They're the ones who announce. They're the announcing angels. And this is one of those angels, an announcing angel sitting there. And they are shocked by it. They're alarmed. They're, they're frightened. Think about this. For the first time in their movement, that began the night before, going to purchase spices, rising up early in the morning, just as the sun is coming up, to make their way to the tomb without regard for, for who might see them going, what might be the implications and consequences of them being found there, how they would get into the tomb, how they would have access to the body to anoint him for burial. For the first time, they're alarmed. For the first time, their fear faces them. The angel senses this and says to them, stop. Don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. You're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. The one who was crucified. And so he is, he's comforting them, connecting with them there that, that he knows why they're there. That they should not be afraid of what they've encountered. He has risen. The most powerful words spoken. If, if we find an amazement when a Roman centurion watches the way Jesus dies on the cross and says, surely... This man was a son of God. If that is gripping to us, this, how much more so? Because think where these women are. They know that he has died. Probably they have heard the teaching that he would rise, but they're not going to the tomb to celebrate a risen Savior. They're going to the tomb to anoint a dead Savior. He is risen. It's the words that give Christianity hope. See, no matter what you're going through today, no matter what your loved ones are going through, the challenges you may face in many different arenas in life, The situation is not hopeless because He is risen. And the angel says, see where he, was, where he was laid. And when they looked there, what they saw was the grave clothes folded up, placed on the bench where His body had formerly laid. Remember, they, they saw where He was laid. The text told us that earlier. And now, the grave clothes. The linen. He's been unwrapped. He's been laid there. He's not here. What are they to do? What's the meaning of this? Well, it becomes, it unfolds to them and to the others gradually as you put the four Gospels together. Go Tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. This could be easily overlooked. Remember what the Gospel of Mark is. We believe, because many historical scholars believe, that Mark is writing Peter's memoirs. And of all the things that have been told in this gospel account, I believe this was probably the most tender and meaningful for Peter. Go tell the disciples. If that had been the statement, question marks would have remained. Peter had denied him repeatedly, intensely, in a vile, vulgar way, had denied him. Yet so tender is the Savior's love for sinners. 
So immovable, unchangeable is his resolve to save sinners. But even a person who has been exposed to great light as Peter had, who had been given great responsibility as Peter had, he spoke more often than not for the twelve. Jesus, through the announcing angel, wants these women to know and wants Peter to know that he is still considered among the disciples. When it would have been very easy for Peter to conclude that he was no longer worthy to be called a disciple. When the enemy of our souls could have beaten him about the head and said, what you have done is beyond repair. You could have stood up for him. You could have defended him. You said you would. And you denied him like a coward to a young woman. You're finished. Now, brothers and sisters, if Peter was not finished, you and I are not finished. We cannot go anywhere and do anything where the devil could in reality say, you're finished as a follower of Jesus Christ. Go tell the disciples, and Peter, one of the most compassionate additions stated in the entire Gospel account. Because Peter was told this. And when you put the accounts together again, he will run to the tomb to see it for himself. Go tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is going before you to Galilee. Just like he told you, he'll meet you there. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to submit to you that when these folks have been taught these things, but as they are experiencing this, their teaching that comes to light and begins to connect and, and lights go off and, and things become clear. And I want to suggest to you that's the way the Christian life is lived. You and I have been taught things. Some of you have been taught things since the earliest of your days. And we want to, we want to know them at a level that moves us to take steps. That's not God's way. God's way is you walk by faith and I'll give you light. It's not the first time these women had heard this. The angel says, just as he told you. He told you he would rise again. He told you he would beat you in Galilee. It didn't, it didn't stick. There's a lesson here for us. That if we're going to get gospel light for the journey, we have got to take those steps of faith one after another. John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress talks about uh, going uh, into, this, into this valley where he, he feels desolation. And he could, said he couldn't see. And all he could hear was howls and shrieks. He said all I could do was put one foot in front of another. One foot in front of another. And sometimes that's the Christian life for us. Where we don't see. We want to know what's behind door number three. Door number one. Door number two. You know, we walk by faith. And as we walk by faith, He gives us light. As we, as we move through life and experience life as followers of Jesus Christ, then there are things that He has taught us, things that you've been taught, that come into focus, that take on meaning, that, that have a depth about them that it did not have before. Before it was a lesson, before it was an idea, now it is a reality, now it is a conviction. Don't let the devil trip you up. And tell you, well, you've got, to, you've got to have conviction about this before you move. No, you've got to move by faith. The Lord will attend you with the conviction. There's so many areas I, th I see people getting paralyzed. If the Lord has taught it, then we're to walk by faith believing it. And trust Him to give us, to give us the attending understanding and strength and conviction for it. And so then we're told that 
they went out and fled from the tomb. Get the picture here. No sense that they fled to the tomb. They were walking to the tomb with a sense of awe, devotion. He's not there. The very purpose that they had gone for was thwarted. It's meaningless. They have spices now they won't use <laughs> to anoint a dead body. And they run from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. The resurrection is no longer an idea, no longer something he had taught that, that they took in at different levels and maybe dismissed and pondered how. No, the resurrection is a reality for them now. Now, it is met with trembling. Astonishment. Amazement. They've seen the hand of God in a way like they've never seen the hand of God before. And initially they say nothing to anyone. For they're gripped with fear. They're gripped with fear. You have to admire the love and devotion of these dear disciples. You have to understand what they're going through as they leave. And put yourself there. I'm going to ask you this as we close this morning. We're celebrating the Christmas time, the birth of Jesus, the recognition of Jesus' birth, the awe and wonder that attended that, that day in Bethlehem. We know it didn't end there. We're studying the Gospel of Mark intentionally at this time to remind us that he didn't remain a baby. He didn't, he didn't stay in a manger. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He, he grew to be a man. He burst on the scene to do the very thing he was sent to do, to keep the whole law of his father, a law that we believe he wrote with his finger on tablets of stone on Sinai. And in the course of time, the fullness of time to come and offer himself up to be the sacrificial lamb, to die for the sins of his people, to, to suffer the punishment that was due unto your sin and my sin, to satisfy the divine justice of God by suffering and dying on a cross. Rising from the grave. When was the last time that caused trembling in you? When was the last time that that astonished you? The prophet Isaiah finishes his prophecy in chapter 66 saying the Lord is looking, looking, and He will look with favor upon the one He finds who has a broken and contrite heart over sin and who trembles at the Word of God. Oh, brothers and sisters, never let the birth of Christ become commonplace to you. Never let the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ become commonplace to you. Read it. Sing it. Share it. Meditate upon it with trembling and astonishment. That's what a true encounter with a resurrected Savior does for you. It changes you. These ladies were never the same. When they go and tell the disciples what they've found, they will never be the same. And I would remind you that the same trembling men who ran cowardly away from Jesus, these same men, about a month and a half later will come out of an upper room 
having had an incredible prayer meeting, and will boldly declare Jesus Christ crucified, risen from the dead, and the advance of Christianity will be underway, and it hasn't stopped for 2,000 years. Will we be in that train, that legacy, that heritage? Boldly proclaim Jesus Christ, crucified for sinners, raised from the dead, ascended on high, returning sooner than probably any of us think. Never lose the wonder. Never lose the awe. Never lose the trembling. Never lose the astonishment. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we read today of our Savior buried and raised from the dead. And we're gripped in new and fresh ways to say hallelujah, hallelujah, what a Savior. There's a lot about this season of Christmas that commends itself as we remember the birth of Jesus. But Lord, never let us be guilty of only telling part of the story. May those we encounter in the way understand that that we see him as born to die, that we might live. And celebrate his birth as setting in motion his death, burial, and resurrection. I pray for those here today, Lord. Some may be carrying heavy burdens. Help them by your Spirit to be delivered from these burdens in the face of an empty tomb. But because our Savior lives, we too, by grace through faith, will live. Because our Savior has conquered the grave, He has conquered sin and death and hell and every foe that would come against us and through Him, by His life, death, burial, and resurrection, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Help me to live that. Help us to live that. In Jesus' name, amen.